Tap it. Yep. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the PAX Prime Magic the Gathering World pa Building Panel. Woo! <laughs> Hi, everybody. There's a lot of material we want to go over today, and we want to have time for questions, so we're going to get right into it. Uh, the Cons of Tarkir trailer premiered last night at the PAX party. Who went to the PAX party? <laughs> All right. Yeah, it was pretty fun. Um, <laughs> so we're going to be showing it to you guys for the second time. And here it is. Yes. Some were born to fight. Some were born to rule. I was never born at all. I returned home. My spirit torn between two dragons. One a tyrant. My world of Tarkir, the dragons have been driven to extinction by the five warrior clans. The fierce Ahmad have conquered the wastes. My former clan have swift horses and swifter tippers. The monks of the Jeskai clan are masters of the mystic arts. Cunning, controlled, and disciplined. The fierce Tiber have come to dominate the icy frontier. Savage opponents with ferocious hearts. The Sultai and their undead servants rule a decadent empire. Ruthless serpents decked in stolen treasures. And the Abzan have become unstoppable desert warriors. Enduring, loyal, and surprisingly hard to kill. This is the world that drew me back. A world that needs you. Torn by battle, trampled by clashing horns, ruled by cars. So this is the cons of Tarkir world building panel. <laughs> uh, I'm Colin Kawakami, the creative manager for Magic R&D. Nice glasses. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I didn't wear those today. Uh, next to me is Brian Trunk from our arch nemesis brand team. Oh. <laughs> next to him is Ari Levitch, a creative designer. And at the far right, Doug Byer from Doug Byer on Tumblr. You might know his voice for Vorthos. Hey guys. Right. Woo! Yeah, woo! woo! All right, so there was a quote on the screen when you guys walked in, and I'm going to pass priority to Doug so he can talk about All that. Right. <laughs> so, uh, when it comes to the world of Tarkir, the, the whole, this whole world begins and ends with this guy, Sarkhan Vol. Sarkhan is a dragon mage. He's a planeswalker who reveres the power and glory of dragons. But he grew up on a world where dragons had been driven to extinction long ago. This is, the last time we saw Sarkhan, he was on Zendikar. He was a servant of Nicol Bolas, the evil dragon. He thought Nicol Bolas represented the, the apex of dragonhood for him. He pledged his loyalty to him. But it turned out that Nicol Bolas had other plans, and Sarkhan's sanity started to unravel. He started to hear voices. In fact, he thought he heard the voice of uh, the spirit dragon Ugin when he was in the chamber called the Eye of Ugin on Zendikar. And now, this, this is actually, this piece of art is the first public uh, sight of Ugin himself over Sarkhan's shoulder here. He's tormented by this, this voice whispering in his mind. So this was our starting point for, for Tarkir. We knew Sarkhan's attitude, we knew his tone, we knew his costuming, we knew his uh, backstory, and we wanted to build an entire world around this. That quote at the very beginning uh, was from Alaren Broken, which was um, the first time we heard anything about Sarkhan's backstory. 
So we knew some tidbits, but we had a lot of gaps to fill. So we know a couple of things about Sarkhan. We know he's connected to dragons. We know he, his mind is unraveling. And we know he's locked in turmoil. So in a way, we, we brought this sa these same qualities to the world he was from, that, that it was a world connected to dragons, that a world in turmoil, and yet uh, this was a world where dragons had been driven extinct. That's, that's canon. We've got to deal with that. <laughs> so how do we portray the absence of dragons? This is the world of Tarkir that, that he comes back to, that, that Sarkhan returns to. At, when he's obsessed with his voice in, in his mind, he comes back to this world. And he's grown up seeing literal remains of dragons scattered across this whole world. We wanted to conjure a place that looked like it could support dragons uh, flying over a thousand years ago, and also uh, clans clashing on this world for centuries. Uh, shout out to Polluted Delta, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag Feshland. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So we wanted to create a world that, that supported that, that, that uh, could conjure the sense of the absence of dragons, which is not easy to do. Uh, but as you can see, they're, they're, they're physical remains, and they're also philosophical remains of the dragons. Each clan in this world has reverence for dragons this, in a sort of the same way that Sarkhan does. Sarkhan has actually planeswalked away from here, has seen dragons. He went to Jund. He's seen plenty of dragons now uh, in, in the flesh. But this world is still obsessed with dragons in a way. Their memory still lives on here, and we wanted to figure out how to portray that. So what we did was uh, use these, we're calling uh, dragon aspects, which are uh, characteristics of dragons that each clan uh, reveres and emulates. So let's go into uh, the clans now, and we'll talk about uh, Sarkhan's original clan, the clan he grew up uh, as part of first here, and that's the Mardu. Yeah. <laughs> So the Mardu emulate the speed of the dragon. That's the characteristic of dragons that they uh, revere the most. If you think of this in terms of like, you know, everyone grew up learning about dinosaurs, but we've never seen them in the flesh. This is kind of this, the same psychology here. They know dragons are the awesomest thing that have ever lived on this world. <laughs> they, just like dinosaurs. <laughs> just like dinosaurs. <laughs> and so they, they, they gravitate to the speed of dragons. So they're symbolized by the wing, the wings of the dragon and uh, they're centered in red, black, and white. So the inspiration for this clan uh, touches on a lot of inspirations. There's uh, the Mongol hordes. Um, there's a little bit of uh, sort of samurai influence in some of their, their costuming. But we definitely wanted to uh, make, give a twist on history. So hello, orc riding a wolf. <laughs> so this, the, uh, the Mardu occupy the craggy uh, plateaus and open spaces where they can crash across the landscape. They need a lot of room. They, there's not a lot of civilization here. This is a world that uh, was scoured by dragons over a thousand years ago and is now still trampled by the clans. The Mardu are not a clan that likes to put down garrisons. They don't, they don't build fortresses. They're about tents and bows and horses. That's all they need. That's, that's all the Mongols needed to conquer all of Asia and parts of Europe. Um, so the same is true of the Mardu. Let's take a look at some of the uh, concept art that led to uh, the world building of the Mardu. Some awesome art here by Wayne Reynolds. You'll notice the, uh, the spikes that she has on her shoulders there. That is not just a cool place to hang a banner that looks cool in the wind. It also helps to kind of tie and emulate the wing of the dragon. It's sort of a similar shape that um, makes you think of that, uh, that dragon aspect. This is a poor, hapless Abzan Avon who has not succeeded in defeating this Mardu warrior. <laughs> <laughs> the Mardu were also excellent riders. We wanted to portray their mastery of, of, of fighting on horseback. So we can see how, you know, we're going to see them uh, throughout the set crashing in, into battle. Here they are sort of trampling some uh, Sultai warriors. And uh, again, you can see those spikes and the, and the uh, sort of ambidextrous, ambidextrous quivers. You can see that also quotes the, uh, the, the wing sensation there. We loved having goblins in this clan. They, <laughs> they emulate the idea of 
speed, right? They're, they attack first, ask questions never. And so <laughs> they also, we, I mean, I don't know if they exactly portray mastery of horseback, but <laughs> how, how many goblins can you fit on one pony? I mean, at least four, I guess. <laughs> so personal favorite uh, that we haven't seen in Magic for a while are orcs. Really excited to have orcs back in Magic. They're perfect for this world. They're brutal warriors. They're fierce. And we're, we took a different road with them. They're not the kind of cowardly iron claw orcs that, uh, from, from Alpha. This is, uh, these are the toughest warriors in the Mardu. And uh, in fact, their Khan is also an orc. We're also uh, bleeding them into black this year. We thought it was a perfect uh, role for, uh, for a black line race that was kind of hefty and powerful. Here's a shot of an amazing mounted orc warrior on the Mardu. The Mardu also branch out into other races. This is a demon. I'm not sure if he qualifies as being in the clan. I think he's chewing on the arm <laughs> of a Mardu warrior. You can tell his armor there. Uh, the Mardu also employ ogres. Um, you can see that they've sort of strapped weapons to his arms and lit him on fire. <laughs> <laughs> that constitutes Mardu strategy. <laughs> The Mardu are also amazing archers. We wanted to really focus on how their magic connects with their archery. This is how they win fights. They're not gonna establish garrisons. They're not going to uh, conquer your territory and govern. They're gonna crash in, take you out, and take your stuff. They don't have to prepare for tomorrow if, if you did. So. <laughs> <laughs> so they're, they're, uh, you might have seen the raid mechanic at the party last night. That, that exemplifies that they uh, attack to, to make their, their uh, strategy come together. And nobody fits this as well as Zergo Helm Smasher, who is the Khan of the Mardu, who uh, actually has a personal beef with Sarkon, but we'll see more of that as the uh, block plays out. All right, let's turn it over to the uh, Just Guy. All right. So I just want to start by saying that uh, this was my first project uh, that I got to work on while when joining the creative team. And I get to geek out over this as uh, much as I hope you guys are. So I'm Very excited to have Ari on the team. Yeah. Thank you. So a little bit about the Jess guy. Um, they identify with the cunning of the dragon. And they take on the, the eye as their symbol. They are centered in blue, but also have white and red. So they kind of have like the serenity of white and discipline of blue. but they also know Kung Fu. So. <laughs> um, the Jeskai Way revolves around the monk, and they believe that the best way to conquer one's enemy is to hone both body and mind. And to do that, they, um, they live and train in monastery strongholds that are built in some of the most remote places in all of Tarkir. And let's see, let's take a look at some of the ways that, or let's take a look at the Jeskai monks themselves and how they, uh, they got their, their final look. And Jeskai monks, you'll notice, have a slimmer profile than most of the other, most of the other uh, clans. And so that it, when they show up in art, they're able to do uh, graceful, graceful maneuvers and really kind of let their martial arts shine. And you can see that this monk has the tattoo of the eye on his forehead. And that is basically to show that he is on his search for enlightenment. You can see in this final, uh, this final art here, uh, some of the monks go, uh, they have the path of the wanderer. So I just want to point out that the monks here aren't just cloistered in their mo monasteries the whole time. They go out on these journeys and they act as wandering protectors. I hope that comes across. So. Um, we are going to see a few uh, returning races, just like we saw orcs in Mardu. There are some uh, older races that are going to make their way uh, into some of these clans. And for the Jess guy, we see the Avon. And the Avon here um, are a little bit different than what we've seen in the past. Um, their, their forelimbs are actually their wings, so a little bit of different morphology from what we've seen in the past. But we notice that in Tarkir, with a world without dragons, they actually managed to thrive. So, um, another returning race that we're going to see, or that we see here, are the Jinn. So it's been, a, it's been a while, it's been a while. Um, what we're doing with the Jinn is a little bit different as well. Uh, we're taking kind of the same approach we did with, uh, with vampires in both Zendikar and Innistrad, and they've become one of the humanoid races on Tarkir. So we see them here doing awesome kung fu. <laughs> um, and the counterpart to the jinn, the ifrit, they are back. And 
yeah, in this world, they come from a place called the Fire Rim. And it is an unforgiving place, and they literally burn with an internal rage. And many of you have come, come to the Just Guy to kind of learn to, to hone that and turn it into uh, martial art. Um, so we see here, um, we, we have, with the Just Guy way, it's all about reaching enlightenment. But if the road to enlightenment on Tark, the road to enlightenment on Tarkir is very dangerous, which has turned them into one of the, uh, some of the most for, uh, formidable warriors. So we have, they take, they take Mantis style very seriously. <laughs> <laughs> it's something a little bit different. But this really speaks to the way we were able to approach the Jess guy. We got to play in a lot of the Kung Fu tropes, and of course, you know, the different styles. We have Mantis style here, but we got to kind of layer magic on top of that. And so we get to see, uh, it's a little bit more fantastical. All the stuff you, you really want to see these monks doing, we get to play with. And we wanted to give the sense that Just Guy monks um, are kind of, kind of a one-person army. That there's, even though they might be surrounded, they're never outmatched. They might be outnumbered, but they could take on all, all comers, basically. Um, with the discipline and kind of the fact that the Just Guy are the caretakers of ancient lore, um, they've become Tarkir's greatest artisans, and they build these, these gigantic golems that uh, kind of protect the monasteries and kind of just show, show their prowess as uh, kind of the curators of knowledge. And the one that sums up all of this best is their Khan, Narset. I can tell you a lot about her, but I don't think anything says it as well as her card. My favorite word on this card is without. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Doug once again to talk about the, another clan. The Teamer. <laughs> the Teamer are about, are about the savagery of the dragon. That's what they revered about the dragons of old. They're represented by the claw, and uh, they're centered in green, also with uh, red and blue. So they're not just about bear punching. <laughs> they are about uh, savagery, but for them that, that means that's, that's their key to survival. The teamer live out in the unforgiving wastelands and wilderness uh, in the north and in the, the uh, icy frontier. And they do whatever they can to survive in this harsh and beautiful place. They've, uh, they've had to adapt Here's them building a, sh a uh, shelter right in the skull of a dragon there on a glacier. So I mean, if this is your life, you, you grow to be extremely tough and powerful. If you live, you know, if you see active volcanoes on your walk to get some water, or if you have to trudge across icy shards of, of ice, um, icy shards of ice. <laughs> Senior creative designer. That's right. <laughs> You, you too can do, can do creative, folks. <laughs> so, that, I, like I was saying, the, these guys are incredibly tough. They, they live with brutal conditions, so they've had to adapt however they can. They uh, employ the power of savage beasts, turning the dangers of the wilds uh, for their own uh, benefit. They uh, also use goblins. So, the goblins here are a little bit different. Uh, we'll even see a few um, white-colored ones that blend in with the snow of their of their uh, native environment, and you know little, they're a little more furry here. We really enjoyed this uh, design of goblins from Tyler and from uh, Richard Witters. We also wanted to represent the mystical side of the teamer. So this color combination is not just about smashing; it's also the same colors that of elementalism in magic. Um, so we wanted to conjure a shamanistic uh, aspect to this, to this clan so we can see how they revere and use the elements. Uh, this shaman here you can see it actually has dragon claws built into her hood and she's channeling elemental magic. They can use this for their, uh, to summon uh, elementals to battle as well. You can see this uh, piece by Darken this is an elemental that was made out of the glacier itself, and also bringing in aspects of uh, dragon remains. This is a, a Shavan Einok. This is a new race in magic. 
This has the creature type Hound Warrior or Hound Scout. Um, they are a canid race that is native to a lot of places in Tarkir. And in different clans, they take on sort of different breed looks. In the Teemer, they have a kind of a, a Malamute or, or Chow look. And they uh, have a lot of deep knowledge about their surroundings that they pass on to the rest of the Teemer. They also have ogres. It's always fun to strap some weaponry to ogres and send them into battle. <laughs> I mean, good strategy keeps working. So just And also, the, the ogres are fit right into the teamer's strategy of kind of avalanche tactics. Use the terrain to your benefit. You know, w w other clans don't understand the wilderness as well, as well as you do. Use that to your advantage. Here's a, a teamer warrior who's actually channeling the savagery of the dragon and manifesting an actual magical dragon claw in battle. And here's a guy who is taking on, I think, 7,000 Obzon warriors by himself. <laughs> and uh, my money's on him, frankly. <laughs> they know how to use their strength. This, this, is, this is what the teamer are, are about. They can channel that savagery and change the odds no matter what they are. Including a guy who punched a bear in the face. <laughs> this is Surak Dragonclaw, who uh, attained his rank not only by punching a bear into two pieces and wearing it as a cloak, <laughs> but also by surviving many, many challenges to his leadership. So he has attained the honorific title of uh, Dr Dragon Claw, and he rules as Khan. So now we're going to look at the, uh, the soul tie. All right, we're going to do this? Yep. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> we practice. are not a sports team. Yeah. <laughs> uh, soul tie. They are represented by the ruthlessness of the dragon, and their symbol is the fang. Uh, they're centered in black with blue and green supporting colors. The Sultai are the clan that has studied draconic magic and has been uh, become both wise and corrupt. And in this concept art, you can see the architectural influence of Angkor Wat, the temple mountains and galleries. And you can also see, if you look in the corner there, uh, they, they use ramps instead of stairs. And they have a crocodile pit. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> like needs a crocodile pit. Every good temple. <laughs> Sultai is a clan of vast wealth who's built a majestic kingdom deep in the primeval jungle. And while there's a sinister decadence to their culture, they're still capable of creating works of mysterious beauty. These are Sultai warriors. Like every clan on, on uh, Tarkir, they have warriors. But theirs are lethal and quick. All right, you remember with uh, the architecture that features ramps, not stairs, that's because they're ruled by the Naga, new creature type. And it is much easier to slither up a ramp than it is to slither up stairs. <laughs> Saltai also have zombies. These are the fuel of the, their culture that they use as servants and sometimes receptacles for secret <laughs> knowledge. This is a great piece of art by Voiken. Uh, the zombies are raised in arcane rituals by the Sultai necromancers. And this is uh, Tigam, a powerful Sultai court efficient. And I could give you, well, actually, I can't give you an anecdote of the character creation on this guy. <laughs> but his haircut is no coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> now, finally, the Sultai were given mastery of graveyard magic by the Rakshasa. This is a creature type cat demon. And they feed on the misery of of the denizens of Tarkir, and they lust after wealth and power. This is a Sultai vampire, and I don't think he's fooling anybody with that face. <laughs> <laughs> but it does illustrate how the Sultai use fear as a weapon. But what, if you were to think of like the most terrifying jungle predator, what would you think of? Carnivorous baboons. <laughs> <laughs> so, so while the Sultai might take you prisoner, you would not live for long. Crocodile pit. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so there was foreshadowing there. So the Sultai are a powerful and malevolent enemy that seeks to subjugate the entire plain of Tarkir. And their con is Sidisi. She is without compassion, and you will either submit to her or join the ranks of her undead servants. Now I'm going to pass it to Brian Trunk, who will tell you how the battle for control of Tarkir will play out in your local game store. I'll One go more first. Plan. Oh. <laughs> forget the <laughs> we, we didn't forget you, Abzai. We're not going to forget well, the We're running long, so we thought we'd do okay. four. <laughs> <laughs> so the Abzan, 
The Alvzan uh, identify with the endurance of the dragon, and so they take on the, the scale as their symbol. They're centered in white, and they have uh, green and black accompanying that. Um, the idea of the scale really permeates their entire culture, and it's the idea that one scale may be strong, but altogether it is an impenetrable hide, and so that's going to inform all of their strategies. Um, this is a concept art, uh, or this concept art of the, uh, their fortress city of Arashin, and you can see that if you, if you look at the, the environments that surround their cities, it is unforgiving. Um, it is a harsh desert called the Shifting Wastes, and they learned uh, very quickly that they have to build uh, defensive walls to protect the things that, that they have managed to cultivate here. And so their architecture is it's all about, defen it's all about um, defense and uh, protecting everything that, uh, the things that are able to grow here, they have to make sure they get to keep. So uh, to do that, they have warriors. And the idea of these warriors, we wanted to really uh, emphasize the idea that um, each warrior would be a tough nut to crack. So um, they are clad in armor that um, has these plates, but also on the plates, uh, they are adorned with, uh, with dragon scales. And so it's, again, a remnant of the time when dragons did exist, and they are incorporating that into uh, to their costuming. Um, the, the Avon are in this clan as well. They look a little bit different. Um, the, the idea was to match it to the environment. So they look like carrion birds or vultures, but uh, these guys here are actually the honor guard of the Khan herself. Um, Avzan also has orcs, and this is something we, we had to figure out what the black lined race was gonna be for the Avzan. And we figured there's, there's orcs in Mardu, um, and saw that if we, if we put them in Avzan, it has, they have to have a different relationship than they do uh, with, with their clan than the, than the Mardu orcs have with theirs. And so what the, what the Avzan do when they go to war, um, when they totally decimate a city, the, the orphans that are left over are brought into the clan. And so the Avzan orcs are remnants from, uh, from victories, Avzan victories, and they are raised in the, into the clan to become, to become soldiers. Um, Avzan fortifications, again, the idea here is uh, we knew that as a defensive uh, clan, we had to define what this looks like. And so they have, they'll have massive keeps with high walls, um, and they really kind of embody the idea that the best offense is a good defense, and when all else fails, I guess bring that defense with you. <laughs> and, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, one thing you'll note is that there is a tree on the, the top of the, the piece of concept art. Um, and this is because in times of war, the Avzan will call on the, their, their ancestors, the, the spirits that live in the trees, to actually wage war beside them. So, creature type spirit. I love that piece. This one too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the Avzan uh, believe that most of a battle is won before swords, are, before swords clash. And um, they are not above uh, using assassins to ensure victory. So we have an orc assassin. Um, Doug talked about the Inok in Teemer. And the, the Abzan also have Inok. Uh, these look a little bit more like jackals. And they were kind of the original inhabitants of the, of the desert, taught the Abzan how to, how to survive here. And actually, be, they are experts in sand calling, a type of magic where you can manipulate sand to scare troop movements, get cr troops lost completely in the desert, or scour the flesh from your enemy, or scour the flesh from your enemy's bones. <laughs> and when the Abzan muster, they organize into huge armies. The person you will find at the front leading them is the Khan atop her, uh, her war chariot. She leads from the front so that her entire army could see where she is at all time. And that is the Abzan. Uh, this is Anna Fenza. And now Brian Trunk will tell you how the <laughs> battle for the control of Tarkir will play out in your local game store. Thanks, Colin. Yeah. <laughs> what do you guys think of the clams? Yeah. Yeah. I like them. So we want to give you guys the opportunity to, to play the clams when you come into the pre-release. Uh, so you'll, as you walk into the store, you're going to see the five banners, one for each one of your clans. And you're going to choose your clan box. Uh, you'll open the clan box, you'll have your five boosters in there, you'll also have a seated booster, and in that seated booster there'll be 
the colors of your clan. And if you guys haven't heard, uh, we've made a change to your promo card. Uh, that promo card will be semi-rare now, uh, semi-random. And it'll still have your pre-release stamp on it, but now there'll be eight different opportunities uh, per color with a total of 40 different promo cards. You guys like that change? Good change. Yeah. At the end of the pre-release, uh, you're gonna be able to write your name on the sticker that's in your box and then go make your mark on your banner uh, just to show additional clan affiliation, have a really good time being part of that clan. Take a, uh, take a picture together as your clan, post it up on social media, and then we'll put a few of those photos up on uh, the Magic website the, the following week. We're gonna let that play out throughout Friday Night Magic starting with launch weekend. Um, there's gonna be five top clans each Friday Night Magic. So when you walk in to your store on Friday night, which is the best night of the week to play Magic. And if you want to know where to go to play Friday Night Magic, you can go to wizards.com and look at the store locator. Walk in the store and you tell your store owner what clan you're playing for the night. At the end of the night, the top con for each clan will be able to write their name up and your victory will live on to the next week. With that, I'm going to pass it back to Doug. No, that goes to me. <laughs> All right. Or to Colin. Yes, and now we come full circle back to Sarkon, who returned to Tarkir, uh, searching for something, searching for dragons, searching for the, the spirit, the lost spirit of his world. But his is not the only story uh, that, have, that takes place on Tarkir. There's other things going on. Uh, so now we give it to Doug, <laughs> and I am not going to throw it to you. Let, let's reveal some stuff, shall we? Who wants to hear some nitty-gritty backstory? <laughs> I said, who wants to go into painstaking detail about some backstory? <laughs> That's right. That's my people. So, Sarkon did return to this world. He, we, we see, we've seen his connection to dragons. We've seen uh, Tarkir's connections to dragons. We've seen his inner turmoil. We've seen Tarkir's turmoil. We've seen uh, Sarkon's madness. He is coming here because he's trying to find the source of this voice in his head. He's trying to find Ugin. He thinks that his home world of Tarkir is where he's going to find that. It turns out that he's not the only one looking for Ugin. Any guesses on who this might be? Oh, look. It's Soren Markov. Some of you may know that Soren and Ugin were two of the planeswalkers who originally trapped the Eldrazi on Zendikar over 6,000 years ago. Ugin is concerned that the Eldrazi are now free and is kind of looking to get the band back together. <laughs> but uh, he's run into a snag. He has tracked across Tarkir. He has uh, found a guide. He's, he's gone to the icy waste in sort of team, teamer territory, and he's found what he feared, which was that Ugin actually is dead. Ugin, the, the one other planeswalker he could rely on to deal with the Eldrazi, he has found that uh, Ugin's remains are scattered in a chasm on Tarkir. This is very bad news for him. In fact, this is a bitter revelation <laughs> for Soren. You can see the uh, flavor text there. Soren says, here you lie then, Ugin. The corpses of worlds will join you in the tomb. So that's not a great situation for Soren. It's a good situation for us, though. And we wouldn't want that card to be the only bitter revelation. <laughs> Yeah, that's the only bitter one. I mean, <laughs> keep reading. So the, the way that, uh, yes, absorb, yes. <laughs> so are you excited now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, uh, the, the method that Soren used to actually find Ugin's remains here uh, is actually kind of a funny story. He oh. has uh, vampirized a teamer warrior, poor guy. <laughs> <laughs> I love this piece of art. This is by uh, Cynthia Shepard, who's like great artist, super nice person. But the fact that she took off that vampire token's shoes, it is just <laughs> so mean. <laughs> It like, wasn't need, enough to, to become a vampire. It's, he's going to take his shoes, too. He do, doesn't need them anymore. He's got flying now. <laughs> so, so Sarkon will also find his way to the same chasm. He's going to discover his greatest fear as well, that Ugin's remains, like this, what do the remains of a spirit dragon look like? Well, this is what they look like. But the closer that Sarkon gets, 
he realizes this is the source of the voice in his head. He's going to feel mystical forces waging here. He's going to feel the import of this place because this is actually the place where Nicol Bolas killed Ugin over a thousand years ago. That's the key to Tarkir's history, and that's the, that's the key to Sarkhan's quest as well. He finds that there's, there's a, a force that pulls him when he's here. He can't name what it is, but soon we're going to see uh, what he experiences there. He wants to, to sort of peek through a little bit of time here. So this is a Khans of Tarkir card that represents <laughs> that place that Sarkhan travels to. The temporal energies here are strong. And if he can break the seal of this place, then he can unleash these temporal energies. So let's look a little farther through time here. This is a different piece of art. That's Sarkhan somewhere. That's someone over his shoulder. <laughs> what is going on here? Well, you're going to find out in Fate Reforged. That's the name of the next set of this block. This is the first time it's being announced. I'm so glad we don't have to call it Dewey anymore. Yes. <laughs> Fate Reforged. Doug, when will people be able to play Fate Reforged? I'm glad you asked that, Colin. Here are the release dates. And with that, we go into Q&A. Uh, like those to of you who want to ask questions, please calmly proceed to the microphones. No trampling, please. Yes. <clears throat> and everybody that asks a question today will be rewarded with a fantastic piece of magic artwork, a uh, gicle print on really nice paper. <laughs> We're ready? Okay, we'll start with uh, you. Hello. Ah, oh, thank you. Um, seeing as now we get to have a set that basically is from ground up as opposed to top down, that was Theros, which sort of design do you prefer? The everything's already done and you drip out magic cards or uh, starting with one single nugget and having to build the world around it? Well, and so for us, it's certainly easier to do a top-down set than it is a bottom-up set. Uh, we, there was a lot of creative contortion uh, contortionism that we had to do to make uh, uh, this entire block. Uh, there's, there's amazing things about both, really. I mean, with top-down, you have this, this automatic connection with the people, the, the, the fans, but our, our job really starts when the, the, that connection ends. So, so we have to actually build what's... Uh, the gaps that are missing. So, I mean, I, I enjoy this block because we started with a quote from, from my book like seven years ago <laughs> and uh, built an entire place basically on like a, a couple of pieces of art and a few sentences of canon. So, I mean, both ways are, are, are part of our jobs and, and super exciting. Yeah, I think uh, coming into this, uh, speaking my first project, just seeing the, the challenges of trying to figure out how to portray the different mechanical, uh, I guess, needs it was just something I, I didn't expect, and it was, it was a lot of fun to work on. Thanks for the question. On the right. Uh, hey. Uh, so people have been asking for Fetchlands to come back for a while, and yay. Yay. Uh, is there, yeah. is Hashtag there, Fetchlands, everyone. <laughs> are we going to see any mechanical interaction with Fetchlands in this set? So I was also on the, the development team for, for cons, and... Uh, this set has a lot of mana fixing. It has sort of, we sort of learned from the uh, issues that Shards of Alara had. It was also a three color oriented block. And the, um, the fetch lands are part of that suite that are helping you cast your spells. We want people to be able to uh, build around the clans and actually build decks that make sense uh, with, the man with those mana bases. So that's really the role of the fetch lands there. This side. So this is the first set since Kamigawa that had a distinctly non-Western European cultural milieu. How do you guys strike a balance between um, 
trying to tie in the recognizable tropes that people can identify with, like we were talking about the, the kung fu guys, um, versus cultural sensitivity when you're stepping outside of a Western European culture set? We, we, we do our homework. So uh, the, it's super important because we, we love to use the real world as inspiration. The, it, is, it is incredibly deep and history has more uh, world building in it than we will ever come up with. So uh, that, that's frequently our starting place. Uh, we always wanna make sure that we're representing cultures uh, sensitively. We look into uh, how that culture represents itself. We, uh, we talk to people, we, we, do our, we do our due diligence to make sure that we're not treading on ground that is considered um, reverent or sacred to, to those cultures. And then we also, uh, magic takes its own spin. So um, we divorce ourselves from the exact uh, culture itself or the mythology, and then Tarkir becomes its own place. And then we're able to push farther and push farther. We, we, we love having cultural inspirations be the root uh, and, and inspiration, but then uh, to progress past so that it becomes a world unto itself. Yeah, we, I mean, we want the multiverse as well to be a very diverse and complex place. This side. Hey, uh, so with Soren and Ugin both uh, being involved in the set, are we gonna get more information or more story about like Soren's backstory, like uh, as well as Ugin's, and like maybe some uh, some of the like origins of the Aldrazi or what's going on with Zendikar or what happened with Zendikar in the past? Yes. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> we 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 do have some plans to explore deeper uh, what's going on with Soren. Ugin and other things. <laughs> Let's talk more hey guys. here. So um, with the impending doom of the core sets and the double block format, um, how do you, uh, so I know you, you have certain you know, puzzle pieces that you have to fit into like type two standard. Uh, how do you deal with the flavor implications of that? Do you, are you going to make more like generic guys like Elvish Mystic that can fit into multiple different types of planes and and environments, or are there going to be some overlap between different planes? Senior creative designer. Uh, that, that, is, that is part of it, yeah. Uh, some of it is having uh, card concepts or, or card names that can be setting non-specific that can move around. There's going to be other opportunities to, to, um, to have certain reprints that we want, though. Uh, we're looking at a product that's uh, mostly aimed at newer players that comes out around the year. Um, so we so that can be a place where we can put some of these key reprints as well, um, but the flavor implications are pretty big. I mean, this was a this was a decision we did not come to lightly. Uh, it's tough for uh, a card, Sarah Angel, whatever she's tied to Dominaria or tied to Sarah's realm. It's very hard to uh, fit such a card in Tarkir. How does this angel get there? So that is part of the ramifications of the uh, the change to the block model, and we're going to see, I think, going forward how we're going to deal with that, but. Can't go into all the details quite yet. So I noticed that um, that the teamers seem very similar in lore and and uh, and mechanics wise to the Naya from Shards of Valera, and I was wondering, um, was is there a lot of uh, ways you guys tried to differentialize them from the original Naya, and uh, are there any similarities you'd like to point out? Yeah, so so there we, we did have Alara in mind a lot when when forging these. The the wedges are highly weird when it comes down to uh, the creative identity. They, uh, the shards also have two enemy colors built into them, but the, uh, the wedges have two enemy colors and their shared, uh, sorry, two allied colors and their shared enemy in them. There's a lot of sort of internal uh, contradiction built into all the clans. That, we, we built on that uh, more than in, in the shards, I think, where you'll see uh, a lot of sort of strange bedfellows built into the clans, and it never really overlapped too badly when we were working on the, on the setting. Um, they really got their own identity, partly uh, because of trying to figure out, like wrestle with this question of how do these three colors make sense as one unit? That answers your question. Hi there. Um, uh, it looks like you actually uh, partially an answered my question. My question was, um, what came first, the wedge of cheese or the cons of Tarkir? Um, and it sounds like uh, that the uh, wet, the decision for the wedge all kind of came first with it. Um, and I guess maybe, uh, would you mind uh, uh, explaining a bit more, like 
how you're uh, to working with trying to fit those uh, um, story elements into those types of colors, if you don't mind, or? Well. I mean, I don't know, he kind of. <coughs> okay, yeah, Wedge is not the only thing going on in this block as well, so there's a lot of really complex uh, creative that has to be gotten across. Uh, and it was it was a it was a lot of work. There are a lot of uh, sitting around in meeting rooms and having very spirited discussions about what we were going to be doing. Right, and it's true that that uh, wedge came in very early on uh, before we started getting into the world billion earnest. Uh, so it was this is not you know this is not top down Asia. This is not top down you know a certain cultural inspiration. We we're, we're focused on bringing these these clan identities to life as uh, known that they knowing that they were wedge. Uh, factions from the get-go. Um, I was wondering how the world-building team kind of balances designing a world that that they're really interested in and proud of and that uh, longtime players are really going to be into and excited with, but also designing something that kind of makes it accessible to, to new players and to players that never really saw themselves as, as magic players, because that's normally how I pull people into magic. It's like, look at this incredible world. Isn't it gorgeous? And you know, when we play, you're gonna fall in love with the mechanics. But I have to get you to the table and the world, the incredible worlds you guys create, that's normally how I do it. Yeah, first, thank you. Thank you for saying that. I'm really super happy that you're using the flavor as the hook to get people into the Yeah, that, that is an awesome show us, by the way. Everybody use that. <laughs> <laughs> flavor first, guys. Uh, I just wanna say, first off, um, I'm still a little heartbroken about the end of Journey in the Mix, but Congratulations, guys. Way to really get us emotionally invested in the story. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, yeah, Jenna's not here, but she was yeah, the one that. I was uh, going to say the blame's probably on Jenna mainly. <laughs> I wouldn't say the blame. Yeah, but no, we don't have to say the blame. Yeah, she, was, she worked really hard on that story. But uh, with the two a block a year model, that means we're going to get to see, like, a return to a lot of planes, see some new ones. Is there any planes in particular you guys would be excited to return to? Yes. Or see in general? <laughs> yes. Not with, like, personally, not like from development wise. It's, it's hard to speculate. I mean, we, we you know, our, our opinions and our preferences have actually colored what we've been working on for the future. So it's hard to go into, I mean, here's a picture of a sunset. I'm sorry, I just can't. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't speculate too much about you the future. You wouldn't want us to spoil the surprise. <laughs> Hi, so I was super excited to see in Concept Arc here that three out of the five cons are female. Uh, this, is true. this is a super refreshing change after being on plane after plane after plane where the powerful men outnumber the powerful women. And I kind of want to ask between this and Magic 2015 having three male and three female planeswalkers, if this sort of like commitment to diversity is something that we can expect going forward on all blocks. Yes. Definitely. It was, this it was is, absolutely, it was absolutely this is like a conscious commitment on Wizards of the Coast part. It, it is something that, that is built into how we talk about uh, building stories and settings. Absolutely. Yeah, and it, we have like a weird cultural thing right now in gaming where I think that for just whatever reason it's harder for women. So for all the women out there, give yourselves a hand and let, you know, we're winning. <laughs> <laughs> Um, with the new style guide, well, not really new, but it, with the recent style guides, a lot of the art has become wall sharper, somewhat uh, samey in a lot of ways. Uh, I was wondering if you had any uh, ideas on returning to adding a lot more like stylized cards that were the hallmark of older sets, such as uh, the Mirage block really comes to mind. The senior art director for R&D is uh, Jeremy Jarvis, and he's awesome. Uh, we're always trying to push uh, the artwork to higher and higher quality levels. So. I hope you're happy with it, and I hope you're happy with it as we go forward. Winter Hummer, it's coming back. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Sunset. <laughs> <laughs> the request is noted. Is that something you would want to see? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let me write that down. Thank you so much for delving back into Innistrad and giving Gisa and Giralf cards. Thank you. Uh, do you have plans to bring other celebrity characters that have happened in the past into cards? Is that like? something you would like to see? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, your request is noted. Yeah, I mean, yes. <laughs> the answer is 
that, that is a thing we consider to be awesome to do. We're always trying to rotate through the, the planeswalkers and bring planeswalkers into the story. But you know, uh, characters that are plane bound, you do have to wait until they go back to we do we go back to the planes to see them, or or in, or in uh, products like Commander or or that sort of thing where we get get a shot to see you know, check in with people. Uh, hi, I just wanted to say uh, thank you for creating this game because I just recently started playing it two years ago and it's like the greatest thing ever. Thank so, you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I have specifically have a question for uh, Ari. Um, being this as one of the very first projects you've worked on, um, I was just as an observation, Magic had very little m new mechanics, and then they introduced Plane Walkers, and it changed the game. What kind of things did you really like find yourself wanting to bring to the table or change? Um, well, I was a history teacher before I started working here, so the fact that we're working on Cons of Tarkir, which was heavily influenced by a lot of uh, historical societies, uh, just that kind of flavor is really what I kind of gravitate toward. And so whenever we're starting to brainstorm ideas, the first thing I do is just kind of pull out all my history books and start, and it's, yeah, it's not really glamorous, I guess I'm just looking through history books. So <laughs> that's what I look for. Oh, come it's on, it's so connected. glamorous, look at this kid. <laughs> <laughs> Ari's, Ari's influence has been amazing. So uh, we it have has. a variety of backgrounds on the creative team. We get to work with amazing people uh, and throughout R&D and Wizards of the Coast. I, I do want to mention, that the number of people who are not up here at this table, there can only be a few of us here, but the number of people whose work and passion goes into making magic is incredible. And I just wanna you know, sort of thank everyone else that we get to work with all the time to help bring this game to life for you guys. Hi, um, I noticed that in several pieces of the art there were goats. I was wondering if goats are making a return. <laughs> or if we'd see any more. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, this is going to be the last question. Sorry, um, guys. I was just kind of wondering that a thousand years ago you said that uh, Nicol Bolas killed Ugin. Did that death spark the extinction of the dragons, or is that kind of too deep of a question for me to ask? That is a very interesting question. We will have to see how the story plays out. <laughs> but I'm not saying there's not a connection. Thank you. Okay, thanks thank to you. everybody. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Woo!